Welcome to OAC's first official monthly broadcast. My name is Christy Kuna. And I'm James Zerbios, and we are so excited to have everybody joining us today for OAC's official broadcast. Christy, before we get started, how is your week going so far? Well, certainly, James. It's so great to be here with you. We are yep. broadcasting live from OAC's headquarters here in sunny Tampa, Florida. And it, it's a, I mean, I just hate to say, this is a highlight for my week so far. I think this broadcast has certainly been something we've been long wanting to do. And I know our followers have wanted it as well. And, and so I'm excited for that. But I'm also excited because fall is in the air. It's, I can't believe it's the end of October already. It's kind of crazy to fall think. Fall for it's, Florida is in the air. Fall for Florida, which means dipping into the 70s, we put our boots on here. So our viewers from all around probably have some different circumstances than our, than our weather. But we love fall here and we, we, we celebrate as much as we can. So how's your week going, James? Oh, pretty good. I mean, I think as you, you said it best that this is really exciting to have the first OACs broadcast and, and it, Halloween is this weekend. Uh, right, we get yeah. an extra hour of sleep. You know, we turn the clocks back. Yeah. And of course, Big day next Tuesday for the U.S., our ah, presidential election. I'm sure that's a topic of a conversation for many folks uh, these days in a number of ways. So we know there's a lot going on, and so we're so happy that you all have joined us for the first broadcast online. And um, we're really excited for this because, you know, as we've talked about, this has been something that has been, you know, in the works for quite some time. And, uh, and, and we're going to jump into a little bit about what the broadcast is all about. But to, to do a look ahead for today, let's give you a, a glimpse of what to expect over the next, uh, next half hour or so. And so we're going to have um, an opportunity to do OEC updates. We're going to give you guys some behind-the-scenes looks at what it is the OEC has been up to, the news, recent news that we've been, uh, we've been in lately. We're also going to dive into a trending topic. We'll do this at every broadcast has to. We'll always have a trending topic that maybe folks want to know a little bit more about. And that trending topic today, of course, is COVID-19 and obesity. It certainly is a topic that's been on everyone's minds and, and has monopolized our lives in many ways. So we'll jump into that as it relates to obesity. And then we're um, excited to have our esteemed president and CEO, Joan Aglowski, join us uh, later in the broadcast to talk about our feature topic, which is challenging the narrative, dispelling common myths about obesity. So I think that we're in for a, a great first broadcast. It is the first one, so I keep saying that just to, to bear with us. We, we have tested everything. We, fingers crossed. Working I think the it, bugs out. That's right. So we're, we're definitely uh, uh, gearing up for a good broadcast. But um, speaking of that, we also have a giveaway that we're doing today. We have actually three giveaways that we're doing for OAC Swag. So all you need to do to enter into that is to comment. So there's a comment portion on the Facebook Live that you're on right now. Say hello, let us get to know you. When you do comment, we will do a drawing at random at the end of the broadcast for James, our OAC swag. Let's tell them a little bit about our swag. Yeah, so first up, we have this OAC hat. It's a Ooh. very nice hat, so definitely make sure you comment, a chance to, to win that. That's a newer item, too. It is a newer yes. item. Yes. And then the OAC coffee mug as well, coffee or tea. Sure. Uh, I don't know if it's microwavable, so you might not want to. Could be top rack only. This is the, the best <laughs> top rack only coffee or tea highly mug. Highly coveted. With the OAC logo on it. Yes, and highly coveted too is the OAC official tumbler. Uh, this is a very popular item. You may have seen this at our previous conventions. We're going to give these away today. So again, just comment in our, in our uh, comment feature there on Facebook Live. And we'll do that drawing at random at the end of the broadcast. So definitely stick around to the very end. And we talked a little bit about how excited we are for today's broadcast and, and, and really the vision for it. And, you know, for those of you that have been longtime OAC members and been with us uh, since the beginning in 2005, you're used to receiving the messages from us via email or on social media. This is new. This is new for us. You all asked for it. You all wanted it. And we are here to deliver. And this is just a great opportunity for us to be able to deliver messages in a new format right. in this, and really break it down with these monthly broadcasts. Yeah, and video, it's safe to say, has become kind of the gold standard in this world that yeah. we're living in. And um, so obviously we're kind of meeting that challenge in that way and bringing this content direct to our audience this way. But I think obesity is such a complex topic. I think anybody following today can probably nod their heads yes to say it is such a complex topic to think about. And so um, we're going to break down these topics throughout all the broadcast. Each month we're going to get into that. We really want to have some real conversations about these topics. They, you know, it's, it's so much of it is just headlines and news stories, but we really want to get to the core of it, what it means for people. And so that's what we really want to do for this and really contribute towards that important topic of changing the narrative all around. I mean, we well, can certainly say it needs to be changed. It absolutely needs to be changed. And what's so interesting about that concept of changing the narrative is, is that this is why the OAC exists. 
So for those of you that aren't familiar with the OAC, we are a national nonprofit organization based out of Tampa, Florida, as Christy mentioned, and we exist to help people with obesity. And really, we operate on four principles of education, advocacy, so, uh, support, and awareness. And our goal, our role, is to represent the patient voice. And Christy, I think you can, you can attest to this, that before the OAC existed, there was no organization that represented people with obesity. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, 15 years ago, we're going on 16 years next year, there was no organization that represented the patient for obesity. And, and every major disease state has representation from the people. And it was a glaring gap that didn't exist so long ago. And so I think I'm proud to say that the OAC has really filled that gap and, and um, fought, brought along a lot of folks along the way and, uh, and through our partnerships in other ways. So it definitely is something that was a glaring acknowledgement that we yep. needed to have happen. So um, definitely there is um, a lot of good stuff in store with that. Hopefully you'll get to know more about the OAC as you continue to join us not only today, but in future broadcasts yes. as well. But speaking of getting to know us, we want to get to know you. So we are um, following along with everybody on the on the live stream, which is this is really exciting. And uh, we have some really um, very diverse regions represented already in our chat. So why don't we say hello to a couple of our of our followers today? Yeah, absolutely. Looks like we have Katie from Minnesota. Minnesota. Hello, Katie. She's probably having a real fall up there. <laughs> uh, Vicki is watching from the Canary Islands. I don't even know what time it is in the Canary Islands, but thank you. I think it's much later than it is here today. So that's awesome. And um, I also see Julie's watching from Safety Harbor. That's actually not too far from our headquarters, nope. right around the corner right from us. Corner. So that's awesome. And it looks like we have Laura from Kuwait. So Laura, thank you for tuning in Very right cool. now, all the way Very from cool. Kuwait. Yeah, and we also, I mean, I'm actually shocked at the international presence. Yes. We also have Angela and Paul who are watching from Liverpool. I think you guys have been to our conventions and we know you quite well. So um, thanks for, for following along today. Yeah, and it looks like we also have uh, Rocky from Pullman oh, as well. So Rock welcome, Rocky. Rocky nice is James' favorite movie. For yes. those of you who, you'll get to know James as he does more of these broadcasts. Rocky is one of his favorite movies. So that's only fitting so for our first broadcast. I, I'm so excited about the audience. I think Absolutely. I'm kind of blown away a little bit by, a, by the diversity in the region. Um, so as we, as we mentioned with, with the broadcast, we want you to follow on in the comments and keep, keep chatting, chat with our fellow um, commenters and, and followers as well. And also we want you to contribute in that way to, um, we're gonna talk about myths, we talked about a little bit later. And this is a great time for you to, to contribute your own myths. We're going to have a laundry list yep. of ones that we have, we have found, but we want to hear from you guys. So uh, list out in, that, in the comments what myths that you often have heard about obesity, and we'll talk about them. So do that um, in the comments, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. Well, and you're definitely going to want to list out the myth because you're, we could potentially answer it, but then also because of the giveaways, oh, too. Oh, yeah. So that the is how giveaways. you will have an opportunity of winning yes. these fabulous prizes, <laughs> fabulous giveaways we have today. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our first portion, which is our um, OAC update section. And so as we mentioned, this is a great time for us to give you a little bit of that behind the scenes on what we've been up to and all the notable things. And so one of the first things we want to talk about is the news from with, with OAC in it. So as um, those who follow us might know that OAC is constantly in the news in different ways. James, your role here yeah. is really specifically focused in delivering and, and to really keep up with the news. So maybe share a couple of the notable things that have happened recently for the, for the audience. Yeah, come. absolutely. OAC is always featured in the media in, in one way or another, or always utilized by different organizations and partners. And two really cool things with one of our partners, Novo Nordisk, that have recently taken place was first, a PSA that was on COVID-19 and obesity. And this was a PSA that Novo and the Creative Coalition put on. Creative Coalition is a nonprofit organization out of uh, Hollywood, California. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the PSA really talks about the implications of COVID-19 and obesity, and, and, and we're actually going to talk about that a little bit more later with Joe. Uh, but what was so cool about this was they featured one of the OAC's key resources, which is the obesitycareproviders.com. Mm -hmm. And essentially, that's the OAC's resource for someone to find a provider to have that conversation of weight. So check out the PSA. You're going to see a lot of familiar faces in there. You're going to see uh, Hank from Breaking Bad and then uh, Tim Daly from Wings and The Sopranos. 
You can check it out at thecreativecoalition.com. Some of your favorite shows, I know that. I think also what's really notable about that is that this is the first time right. since we've been doing this that we've seen celebrities really step up to the plate and really talk about obesity openly and yep. talk about the impact on people. And so I was really, really excited to see that finally happen. It's been honestly something that we have been wanting to happen for quite some time. So if this was the time that had to happen, then we're happy that it had to be now. Yeah, absolutely. And the next one was the uh, Huddle Up, Let's Talk About Obesity. And this is another initiative between Novo Nordisk and the NFL Alumni Association. And again, featuring the OAC's Obesity Care Providers Locator. And so you can check out more about that initiative at huddleupobesity.com as well. Very cool. Very cool. And then lastly, this one was huge when we learned about it. Uh, so the OAC is now listed as the resource on the CDC's website for People First Language for Obesity. Uh, People First Language for Obesity is a fairly new concept, and really what it is is the difference between saying someone is obese versus has obesity or affected by obesity. But right now on the CDC's website, they actually list the OAC as a reference when how to discuss obesity. Wow. That is absolutely monumental. And it, it really, it's a testament to the hard work and advocacy of the OAC and all of our members. Yeah, and I think we just saw a glimpse of what that looked like on the screen there. So I'm happy we provided that snapshot because uh, to see that in, in the way it is and the reference point is a major victory. I mean, it's been something that, again, we have been wanting to happen for a long time to acknowledge the importance of people first language. And really what that plays into is how it strengthens our efforts to combat weight bias. And I know we'll give an update on that here in just a little bit. Well, thank you for sharing that because I think those are some great things to know. OAC is in the news all the time, but these are some really pivotal things that I think are going to really help us move the efforts forward. And speaking of moving efforts forward, I have to mention how busy our committees have been lately. Um, OAC is privileged to have said great list of working committees, 100% volunteers. Volunteers are truly the core of what we do, and that's how much of our work gets accomplished, is through our committees. And so I think it's important to know that they've been quite busy. I think we're on calls pretty much every week Just in the evenings. Every week they right give now. their time generously, so we so appreciate their, their help with that. And a couple of things we're working on is really looking ahead to our five-year goals, yep. strategizing for what the you know, next five years looks like, which is you know, pretty crazy to think that you know, we look that far ahead. Uh, we're also focused right now on diversity and really making sure we have a whole task force that's focused on ensuring that the OAC keeps this of utmost priority in, in our efforts and, and for the organization. Um, and then also weight bias, is, it's, it's safe to say, has been something that we continually work on, but things are really heating up right now. And so I know the committee's been working on some great things as well as you, so maybe give a little bit of a glimpse into what, what weight bias activities look like right now. Yeah, absolutely. The, the weight bias committee right now is really working on a, a lot of research. And we've done four different public surveys where we look at weight bias in, in, in different areas. And the, the thing about the research is it helps open our eyes to bias and see, you know, where is it occurring and how is it impacting people? Yeah, and so with, you know, research and such that's happening, I mean, I think we always wonder, how does that really affect per the person who has obesity? And, and there's all these efforts that are happening, but how does, how does that really impact the lives of people? Yeah, it's a good question, Christy. And I think the, the, the issue with the, the, when it comes to research, or the, the, the great thing about it, I should say, is that it helps let us know where things are occurring and how we can help improve them. So for example, in some of the research that we've done, we've seen that one of the places that weight bias is the most prevalent is in healthcare. And so what that tells us is that we need to be working with our healthcare partners and helping them educate their members about how to have that conversation of weight with their patients. So to really to have it be more of a proactive, positive conversation to where somebody doesn't feel like they were targeted by weight bias. Yeah, and I know you have a lot of great initiatives coming our way uh, here in the next uh, we do, we several do. months, you're, too. You're going to want to tune in to future broadcasts yes. because we're going to be unveiling some very cool things with weight bias. Big announcement. So thanks for sharing that. Weight bias is a, is a main priority for the OAC and other things, but I think definitely it's something that we uh, work on each and every day. So thanks for sharing that. I know you mentioned a little bit about some of the uh, partnerships we have on the healthcare front, but I think it is noble to also note that OAC has, does a lot of work not only here in the United States, but also globally as well. And I think um, a couple things that have happened recently with our global partners is that one of our um, 
uh, partners over in Europe, the European Coalition for People Living with Obesity, just hosted their um, weight bias, speaking of weight bias, Awareness Day, uh, Living with Obesity. And it was a campaign that they did last week. Really, I think this ties in perfectly to our efforts to with, with really this, this um, push for people first language and how important it is. We did do a write up about this on the OAC's blog. So if you go to our homepage on the website, you can check this out and kind of look at our take on it. But uh, kudos to our, our friends over at ECPO because that was a, a really great uh, event and, and uh, a message to put out there. In addition to our friends over at Obesity Canada, we work with the Canadians a bit, uh, yeah. quite a bit as well. And uh, they also recently held their summit, their patient summit. It had to go virtual in this, in this world of COVID. But um, congrats to them for also hosting a really successful event to, as part of their new Connect um, you initiative. You know, what I find so fascinating about that, Christy, is come March or April of 2021, OAC is going to be 16 years old. Right. And if you think about it, how years ago, OAC was really the only organization, right? And so we've been the so trailblazer. We knew up, right? we, we right. knew up for yeah. obesity and, and representing the, the, the patient voice. And now, just listening to you here talk about this, about all these places in Europe and Canada and everywhere else that all these things are taking place, that's fascinating it to is. see that, 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 that patient movement the, the person affected by obesity, that movement is happening worldwide. Yeah, and so necessary too, I think it's safe to say. And I think we'll give a much bigger glimpse at this as we continue on with these broadcasts and how, how this is, is happening. Um, and, and speaking of that movement too, and kind of the patient voice is one of the other notable things that's happening next week. Just something we wanted to mention is Obesity Week is happening um, not starting next week. And this is something that we normally would attend, but it's gone virtual again this year. Um, it's not our meeting, but it's a meeting that we always participate in. And so maybe James, give folks a glimpse at home a little bit about what Obesity Week is and just what to what to look out for in this and the future broadcast. Yeah, absolutely. So Obesity Week, as Christy said, is, is normally the uh, a meeting that we would go to. We would have an exhibit booth and, and be there on behalf of our members. And so this year it's virtual, as many meetings are, uh, but we're so excited because we have OAC members speaking at Obesity week throughout the entire week. And this is really a place where you see research published, the latest research on this. Um, and the, the, the patients are there to help educate the professionals uh, from that patient perspective. In fact, I, I see here, uh, Laura says, I love this. Patient education is so important. Yeah. Laura, I couldn't agree with you more. Patient education is, is what we do as an organization. And so to have patients at Obesity Week and educating professionals on that patient viewpoint is just so amazing. And we're going to talk about what happened at Obesity Week in our next broadcast. Yes. So, so stay tuned. We're definitely going to cover that. All the more reason to stick around for next month as well. Um, so definitely lots happening. Um, and we, um, in each broadcast, want to make sure we also provide you with our official advocacy update. Advocacy, obviously, as James mentioned earlier, is one of the key pillars of the organization. And so for this update today, we have to talk about the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act. And so for those who follow along with the OAC, you've probably seen this um, in our emails and our pushes and, and, and action alerts for this. And But if you're new to this, um, that's that's fine because we certainly want to drum up some more support for this. So the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act is critical legislation that the OAC has been working on for a while. And I know you work a lot with this along with Joe, our President and CEO, um, who works on this uh, quite a bit as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. I work with Joe and then and Chris Gallagher out yeah. of uh, Washington, D.C., OAC's policy consultant as well. And the Treat and Re Reduce Obesity Act essentially would provide Medicare beneficiaries with coverage for obesity treatments. Now, you might be sitting there watching today and say, well, I don't, I'm not on Medicare and I don't know, you know, it'd be a while before I am. So this really doesn't impact me. It's actually not true. So most times when Medicare provides coverage for something, the private sector will follow suit. That is why this is so important. And this is a very critical time right now. OAC was just on Capitol Hill virtually uh, in September where we had our Hill Day. Many of you probably contacted your legislators via the OAC Action Center. We thank you very much for that. And you've probably heard a lot about the COVID-19 relief package, not even in relation to the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, but did you know that the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act could be included in something like the COVID-19 relief package? And and Joe is going to talk about this in a moment, and he's very well versed on yeah. this topic. And we'll get to learn a little bit more about how exactly those two things can work together. Well, I think that serves as the perfect segue. If we can bring on Joe right now, a little bit earlier than anticipated, to talk about COVID-19 obesity. I think Joe is ready, standing by. He's going to join us. Uh, there he is. He's in our OEC headquarters here. Hello, hey, Joe. Joe. Hi, guys. Just a few doors down as we remain socially distanced, obviously. So, Joe, thanks for joining us from a few doors down in your office in our headquarters in Tampa. And... We know your schedule's busy, so thanks for, for taking time for this. 
No, my, my pleasure to be here. And, you know, in, in the non-COVID world, you, I suddenly would have just risen out of the center right there in front of the bookcase <laughs> right. and, and been present. But, but since we are required to be uh, uh, six feet apart, uh, I'm, I'm participating from my office. But, but great job with the broadcast so far and, and looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think COVID-19 and obesity or COVID-19 specifically has been on our minds for well too long. I think we can all attest to um, but specifically as it relates to obesity, I think in the recent months we've seen a lot of new headlines and recent headlines that are talking about the connection between COVID-19 and obesity. I think folks at home probably have been wondering and getting mixed messages about what does that mean for me. Well, the, he and the headlines can be confusing. Absolutely, yeah. And so I think this is a good time. I mean, Joe, you follow this to a T. You keep a pulse on all the different meetings and roundtables and, and keeping that pulse. So um, maybe give folks a glimpse as to what really the connection is and what does what does it really what does it really mean? Yeah, so I appreciate the opportunity. And again, there are a lot of headlines out there, and it's sometimes it is tough to, to follow the information. But I, I will just emphasize to all of you uh, watching today that it is important that we be cautious, especially around COVID nineteen. For those of us that live with overweight or obesity. You know, the data is pretty clear. We are at much higher risk of developing complications. In fact, pretty dramatically higher risk of developing complications, including the worst complication, which is death, of course. And, and, and so I would just urge uh, our participants to be especially cautious, follow those guidelines, wear your mask, keep your social distancing, do all the things that we, we, need, we need to do to stay safe. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, Joe, why is that? Why, why do people with obesity uh, seem to have a higher risk of complication? And, and I think it, it, we believe it has something to do with inflammation. Of course, studies will eventually tell us this over time. But basically, uh, obesity causes inflammation in your body, and so does COVID-19. And you combine these two, and it appears that we uh, lead people to much worse outcomes. One confusion point that I, I do want to recognize and, 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 and talk a little bit about is you know, remember what I'm saying is that you, if you develop COVID-19, you have a higher risk. Now, there is a, you know, an ongoing question of whether or not you have a higher risk of getting COVID in the first place. And I do not think the data is strong enough to make that statement yet. And, and so I would just be very, 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 very clear that if you develop COVID, you're at higher risk. Do you have a higher risk of getting COVID? I don't, I don't think the data is there yet. Uh, maybe I'll be proven wrong someday, but the, uh, the scientists are continuing to research that right now. Well, Joe, I think you bring up such a valuable point there because sometimes, uh, and we live in a headline-driven world, right? And so a headline grabs somebody's attention and there's a lot of misinformation sometimes in the way it's worded or the way that, you know, the, what's the clip say? And I think people get um, overwhelmed by that. And I think they, you know, the message can be, can be misconstrued, but you know, for folks right now that are watching this broadcast and saying to themselves, well, what can I do? What do I do now, right? I think more and more people are coming to the realization that their weight is impacting their health. We've seen this uh, an, of an uptick in those seeking treatment in, in articles from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. But what would you say to somebody right now who's watching this and is maybe saying to themselves, I, ha I, ha I have to do something about this? Yeah, so, so first... If, if you show any symptoms or you find yourself exposed, pl please do not delay seeking health care, right? There, you, you can find health care now. Many, much of it can be delivered by a telemedicine. You should not be afraid uh, to seek a health care provider. But if this is also now the time where you've actually um, been motivated to try to address your obesity, um, that care is available as well. And in fact, we're hearing from practices across the country that, that more and more people love this format of telemedicine, right? And that they're actually able to get good quality care uh, from a healthcare provider around these issues. And, and I think the, the one, you know, one of our challenges, of course, and we'll talk more about this in the myths, is that um, not everyone has a healthcare provider who appears to be ready to help them with their weight. So I would just encourage folks that if, if today is the day you've decided you wanna do something to address your obesity or restart that effort or continue that effort, check out OEC's obesitycareproviders.com database, because from that database, you could identify a healthcare provider in your area, whether that be a specialist in obesity medicine or a dietitian or surgeon or others to, to help you in that journey. Yeah, and I think one of the, the, the takeaways for me with that too is that we know that um, folks are reluctant to seek care because um, you know, they, they feel like they're ashamed of, of seeking care. And this idea that it's okay to ask for help with obesity is still a novel concept, but what, one that we really try very much to change. Right. But now more than ever, I think it's important to know that it's okay to ask for, for help 
with, with your weight with obesity. And don't delay the care is what you talked about because these are truly, you know, crucial times for, for health. And now is not now is the time to really feel comfortable and confident to be able to go in. And as Joe, you mentioned, there are some great resources out there because I know it's something that's a little bit intimidating if you haven't started the conversation or addressed it in some way. Yeah, I completely agree, Christy. And I do want to, since I was listening to you guys talk earlier about the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, uh, just take, take a second here to talk about that as well in relation to this issue. So, so if you do decide today that you want to seek help and then you, know, you, you call your provider, but then they talk to you about how your insurance is not going to cover it, that's why getting legislation like the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act passed is so very, very important. So we can eliminate those barriers. So I, I know James already encouraged it, but I, I would encourage all of you, if you haven't already written to your elected officials about the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, to please do so. I know it is election time next week, and you might you you may think your letter is not going to get read or not going to matter, but it is going to matter because you know towards the middle of November, towards the end of November, and into December, we'll have what's called the lame duck session in Congress. And, and there is a good possibility that we could attach the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act to some uh, important legislation that needs to pass during that time, including the COVID relief package. So, um, so please, please um, um, reach out to your officials. And if you are being denied care, remember OAC is here for you as well. And, and our, at our Action Center on our website, you can actually find ways to report those challenges about being denied care. And, and we have a team here that will try our best to help you with that. Yeah, and you know, one thing too, because we're following along with our, our viewers, and uh, we actually have a comment around this that emphasizes that TROA is so important. As an RDN, I've been advocating for TROA since day one, and it's the first strong advocacy that I ever did. I love hearing that yeah. because, you know, it's like you said, you may not think that, especially during these crazy times with the election, that your voice is drowned out by all of the all of the noise, but it truly isn't, and now is a crucial time as, as much as any to, to, to act on that. So that's awesome that I, I appreciate someone sharing that, that testimony of advocacy. And advocacy is something that is... Um, is something, as, as Joe's given that, that glimpse behind the scenes of this is stuff that we are working on all the time. And I think sometimes it's hard to tell that by all the activities, but this is definitely something Joe spends most of the time. In a non-COVID world, usually, Joe, you're traveling uh, yeah. <laughs> um, probably every week and back and forth to D.C. So I think it's been really interesting doing that virtually now. Yeah, the, actually, I, I, I talked to someone about this earlier today. The last time I was on an airplane was actually Obesity Care Week, uh, which was <laughs> March of this year, right? So that that is the longest time in my professional career that I've uh, uh, been at home for a, a stretch of time here. So lo looking forward to those days. But we are able to engage in advocacy virtually. And in fact, in some ways, it's more efficient, right? Because we can pound right. in more of those visits via Zoom uh, during the day and, and look forward to more of that uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the lame duck session. And then, of course, if we have to continue into next year, we'll have lots of new elected officials who uh, will need education. And there'll be probably great opportunities for people come February, March, April to engage in that advocacy with us. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, that's certainly, I think that, um, I appreciate you sharing kind of your insights on, on COVID-19 and obesity. I think it's still, we're learning so much. We'll continue to learn a lot and, and definitely we'll provide that information to our viewers and, Absolutely. and to our followers. So I think it kind of falls nicely though into what our featured topic is today, which is challenging the narrative, dispelling common obesity myths. And, you know, obesity, it's safe to say, is so complex. It's, we, we, we talk so much about that. that there's a glaring admission that that's very complex. And the narrative is false. It's rooted in bias, and, and that's something that we're, we look to change quite, quite often in our, in our efforts. Absolutely, and I think that it's that narrative that is, um, it's difficult to change that narrative. But, you know, that's really why we look to you, uh, the people that help OAC, our OAC right. members, because so much misinformation, I think, is put out on a daily basis. And then to, for us to be able to have this opportunity now to, to come to you in this format and have this dialogue and have Joe on as an expert to talk about these myths, really helps drive that point home that the, the time to change that narrative is now. Yeah. And so what we've done is we have put together um, kind of, in all the work that we've done, we put our heads together and came up with some common myths that we hear all the time in the work that we do and all the experiences that we have with, with our members. So we wanted to, um, Joe, springboard a couple of these off of you to kind of get your insights and kind of how you would respond to these myths. I mean, we consider them myths. Um, so we have some uh, some statements that I think will be will resonate with a lot of folks at home too. Um, so let's start from our first one, which is ob uh, the statement we often hear that obesity is not a disease, but it's a choice or a lifestyle choice. So what would you say to that? 
So I, I think I'd be pretty blunt on this one. Who, who would choose to have obesity, right? The, the reality is that the stigma associated with obesity is so great, the health complications associated with obesity would be so great. It is not is definitely not a choice, right? And, and no, no one would voluntarily choose to, to live with, with those that stigma and or those health consequences. You know, obesity is a disease, and one of the things I'm so very, very proud of is, you know, when we started OEC in, in 2005, you know, one of the first things that one of the first publications James was responsible for that we wrote actually uh, referred to obesity as a disease in 2005. And I don't necessarily know that we were making a political stance or a statement at that time doing it. That's just what we thought. And that's how we referred to it. And it took, you know, uh, quite a number of years later in 2013, the American Medical Association has now uh, recognized obesity as a disease. And the good news is that that message is starting to resonate with the public, you know, from our own research as well as others' research, we're starting to see um, uh, primarily healthcare providers, but even the public starting to now uh, recognize obesity as a disease and not about some personal failure or some personal choice. Yeah. Uh, Joe, I, don't, I think we, could, we couldn't agree more with you on that one. And I, and I think the second one, you talked about failure and personal choice, and this is something that I think we've heard so often at OAC, uh, and really plays into the weight bias. Shaming tactics will motivate people to lose weight. So another one that frustrates me, and, and one I hear all the time as well, and in fact, you know, whenever we've had someone who uh, we've had to call out as an organization because of, uh, of, uh, of what we consider weight bias, they often come to me or they respond to us by saying, hey, I did that because I was trying to motivate people to address their weight issues. And, and I just want to be very, very clear here, and, and this has been repeated over and over again in, in scientific research, you know, shaming actually causes people to gain weight. It, it turns them towards food, it turns them towards anxiety, it turns them towards depression. And so if you are engaging in shaming, you are part of the problem. You are contributing to the obesity epidemic by doing so. It, 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 is, it is very important that we, we tackle this myth that shaming people helps them. And I know this hits a lot of us at home, right? It hit me at home. This is something that I, I have to admit as a, a child, I, I shamed a loved one because of their weight. And it wasn't because I was a bad person, it was because I was afraid for them, but I didn't understand that I was actually part of the problem and not part of the solution. Fortunately, I've had the chance to actually uh, reconcile over those issues. And, and now I can be a greater help to that person who still, with, like me, struggles with their weight to this day. Yeah, so you brought up a couple points in there, Joe. I think we actually saw one of our um, followers on social media share the same thing around, you know, um, you know, leading to depression and, and anxiety and kind of, diff you know, changing then their their uh, their their lifestyle in certain ways. So I I, I appreciate you sharing that because that was some sentiment from our followers at home. I also think that it's it's interesting if you look at um, you know the movement for smoking cessation. And how that, you know, you could argue or some people would argue that, well, it was shaming that actually has helped, you know, reduce the number of smokers um, that we have. Um, so, I mean, how would you correlate that analogy or, or think about that movement compared to kind of obesity? Because both are kind of that, that blaming tactic, right? Yeah, and I would, I would just tell you that I think that if you talk to the folks who really worked in smoking cessation, many of them will say it wasn't the stigma and the shaming that actually contributed. It, it was prevention and treatment policies, right? It was a commitment to reduce smoking and to prevent people from starting smoking, as well as developing really novel treatment programs. And when you combine those two, uh, it created that environment. The other thing I will just tell you, and it's important to recognize, is that, you know, you do not have to smoke to live, but all of us have to eat to live. So when we draw that comparison, it is not a perfect comparison. And I, and I would just urge some caution, right? No matter what, all of us will, you know, after a number of days have to eat something uh, to be able to survive. You definitely do not have to smoke to survive. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think you can't argue with that. Um, we have a couple supporting comments online that um, Patty has shared support, not shame. I think that's a great takeaway from that. Support is, is crucial. Uh, so the next one that we'll get into is um, the, the common uh, thought that there are no physicians that are trained specifically in weight management. So would you say that's a myth, Joe? Yeah, so I, I, I do think that's a, a myth as well. I will admit that um, we, we live in a world that's a very odd one, and I actually saw this comment early on in the, uh, in the comments as well around where everyone believes they're an expert in obesity, right? And right. the reality is, is not everyone is not, you know, even your personal experience doesn't necessarily make you an, an expert on everyone else's obesity. 
But but I, I will say that we find that many primary care providers specifically don't, you know, haven't developed the skills to adequately treat obesity. Um, but there are programs working to change that. And we actually now even have new certifications. And we have uh, folks that receive the American Board of Obesity Medicine, uh, which we finally call we finally call ABOM, uh, that actually, you know, recognizes physicians in this case as uh, experts in caring for obesity. So if you or someone today is saying, I want to look for someone to help me, a physician to look to help me today about my weight, I would look for someone with that ABOM certification. And also worth recognizing that there are other certifications as well for our friends that are nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, uh, registered dietitians, and others, that there are specific uh, certificates and certifications they can receive. And again, a great way to find folks that have these certifications is to go to OEC's obesitycareproviders.com uh, website, as we actually do prioritize, especially those that have the ABOM certification uh, on, that, on that database. So Joe, as we started to talk a little bit about that right there, finding a provider that you could talk to and maybe discussing some options, I think our next myth here and I'm going to add to it a little bit here. So it says medication and bariatric surgery are the easy ways easy ways out. And I'm going to add to this and say, and I only can choose one of them. Yeah, and, I, and a thing we hear all the time. And, and again, as we try to get obesity treated and recognized just like any other disease, I would actually ask you, would you believe that if we put any other disease, if, we, if we, those medications or surgery for any, or for any other disease? And you would say, no, of course, I don't believe that. We're perfectly fine you know, if you need to take blood pressure medicine or you need chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery for your cancer. Of course, that's considered the norm, right? And, and so I think we need to change uh, this sentiment. You know, it's based in bias. You know, there is no treatment for obesity that truly is easy in any way, shape, or form. There are risks, there are consequences. Um, it, it's a lifelong effort. And to your point about, you know, it's a kind of a, a once, a one kind of option kind of thing, or, you know, something you can only do once, you know, your obesity, unfortunately, your obesity is a chronic disease. It never goes away. So even if you're successfully treated today, doesn't mean that you are not going to need another treatment tomorrow. And so I, I think it's important to recognize that you know, medications and bariatric surgeries are an important part of uh, the treatment continuum. And even if you don't need them today, you, you, you definitely want to live in a world where they are available tomorrow. Um, another thing I want to raise around this um, is very that, you know, no treatment is a miracle, right? We, we, we definitely don't see a world where uh, every treatment is expected to work for every person. And so it is important that we have a range of treatments be available. And, and a final point, and, and, and this is something, and it's kind of another myth we could have put on here and added to it, but it's related, is around this perception about these treatments being a last resort. And, and I get really frustrated with that statement. You know, you know, we don't, you know, you know, a last resort, you know, implies that what happens if you have to go through the last resort and you're unsuccessful, right? That, that doesn't help anybody because, again, this is a continuum and we need to move people through this process. And, and I will recognize that it's important to note that it is actually easier to intervene with uh, someone who has obesity earlier in their journey. And, and, and so I, I think, and, and the other thing that I'll say around that too is that if, and I'm sure folks that are, are commenting right now can share this as well, many of them probably wish they went through their intervention if they've been successfully treated, that they went through their intervention early, right? Earlier, they waited too long, right? They wish they had made that decision earlier. And I think these attitudes about easy way out, last resort, they really keep people from seeking the help they need now. And, and they are a major barrier. Yeah. Yeah, and I absolutely made some really important points there. And I think it kind of brings us to the next myth that we want to talk about, this idea of success versus failure. And I think you kind of touched on that a little bit. So the next myth we commonly hear is that weight loss is the only measurement of success. Yeah, and I actually don't think weight loss is the right measurement of success at all. I think your overall health and your quality of life is the true measure of success. Our society gets so focused on BMI. I, many of you have heard me speak before. You always hear me say this. They, you know, society thinks we should all look like men's health and women's health cover models, and that's not the reality for most folks. You know, health benefits really start at modest weight loss. You know, from five to ten percent, and of course, greater weight losses can lead to greater benefit. But I, I, you know, much of the things that we think about as success, and I think we need to redefine what success is and make success about the improvements that you've had in your quality of your life and your quality of health. Success is 
the having less medications to take. Success is being able to get on the floor and play with your children or your grandchildren, things we call non-scale victories, right? I, I think our obsession with the scale is is part of our problem. Our obsession with numbers is part yeah. of the problem. And, and it really should be, a, a, the obsession should be about how we feel and uh, and how we're better able to function as people. Absolutely. Yeah, and those non-scale victories I think we commonly hear are are the most remarkable in someone's journey. and. Um, and that's it's often what we want to see is the achievement more than anything is, is to be able to live a happier, healthier life um, in whatever capacity. Yeah, and I, for our next one, I actually have a comment that just came in from Susie. And Susie says, so many feel shame at needing help after bariatric surgery as they were using the term gold standard mm -hmm. as if it was the end of this journey. And I actually think that fits perfect with the next myth, Joe, which is I failed to be successful with my treatment. Yeah, another another interesting you know phrasing here. You know, we talk about changing the language and, and mindset around obesity, and this is another example, right? Um, you know, you are not a failure at your treatment. Your treatment failed you, right? Or your treatment is not currently working for you, and we could add something else to try to enhance it. You know, I, I think when we think about some of these things. You know, again, if we were using cancer as the analogy, no one says I failed chemotherapy. No, chemotherapy didn't work for them and they move on to the next treatment option, right? And, and we, need to, we need to talk about that. We need to think about obesity as a continuum and as a chronic illness. You know, we need to stop with the self-blame. You know, I, I will say, you know, after I um, uh, started working in nonprofits, many of you know I was a microbiologist by training and came out and, and suddenly I started working in nonprofits. And I, so I went and took some business courses and I took a marketing class and and this is well before our days working in obesity. And the, and the professor actually cited to me what he thought was the perfect business model. He said, you know what? What we're going to do is we're going to put, a, put um, some sand inside a pill, and we're going to sell the pill as a weight loss drug or as a, a miracle weight loss supplement. And, and we're going to offer double the money back guarantee. And the, and the class, of course, said, well, everyone's going to ask for their money back, and you're going to lose money as, uh, you know, you're going to lose a fortune. And he actually said, no, we won't, because he recognized that people with obesity would just assume they were the problem and not the pill and therefore not ask for the money back. And, and so we, we need to change that, right? We, we need to say the treatment failed you. You did not fail the treatment. Uh, and I think it's important that we change that mindset. And then of course we could have an interesting debate about the word failure itself too, which probably for a whole nother conversation for another day. But, but I, I do think you know, I, I would just encourage you not ever to think of yourself as a failure when it comes to your obesity care. The treatment is what failed. Joe, I think that's such a, a fascinating concept there, that, that the treatment failed the person versus the person failed the treatment. And, you know, as we dig more and more into these myths, again, for all those watching us right now, what are your myths? What have you heard uh, that we can pose these questions to Joe? And we can even discuss here as well in the studio. Uh, so don't forget to comment because we definitely want to hear what your myths are too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have one more on our list and hopefully we can get to some of those. But the last one on our list here is one that has to do with kind of comparing yourself. And so um, there's a common statement of I should have the same results with the same treatment type as all individuals. So more or less what that is saying is that the way my friend lost weight, it should be something that works for me. Yeah, and again, I think we all have the tendency to make comparisons. We all, you know, uh, see someone who did tried something new, and you want to try it, and you think it's going to work exactly the same. But, but the, you know, the reality of our genetics, our environment, our upbringing, all of these things that combine to um, influence our body weight and our biology, um, it means that every individual is different. Uh, I will admit, and especially see this in our friends in bariatric surgery on the message board, you see on the message board, I'm, I'm a month out, how much weight did you lose in a month out? This is how much I've weighed. They wanna compare themselves. I know it is natural, um, but because our circumstances and our biology are so different, we, we, we need to try to avoid doing that. Our story and our weight journey, our obesity journey is very personal. Um, and we're not going to be the same. So I would just I would urge you to to be cautious about comparing, and and be cautious about uh, even be cautious about. So for example, as we we talked about uh, how treatments uh, may have failed you, you know when you talk about treatments having failed you, recognizing that just because a treatment failed you 
doesn't mean that treatment will fail the next person, right? Because again, it, this is, is such a complicated area. And, and someday we'll have the science, we'll have an algorithm that says, hey, based on your genetics and your, and your individual life circumstances, this is the perfect treatment for you. And in fact, OEC is part of a big project that's working on that, that data will be a, a decade away. But it, it, it is something that, you know, we're not there now. And so we don't know what the perfect treatment is for everyone. So again, I, I just, just be very, very cautious in comparing yourself yeah. to others. Absolutely. So Joe, I think this is a really good one for us to end the myths on. It was actually sourced. We had, somebody submitted this and, and it's one that is, um, is, can be controversial at times. And so I'm curious to your thoughts on it. And it's, you can't be overweight and healthy. Yeah, so this this will come down the definitions here. So I, I will tell you that, this, for example, my definition of obesity is you having extra body fat that causes harm to your health. And so we definitely know people who still have extra body fat uh, and have lost even a modest amount of weight and their health is no longer impacted. And, and in my view, then you, you wouldn't be defined as having obesity and you'd be defined as healthy. And so I, I, do, I do think this can be controversial, but, but I, I also will remind folks that you know, you can be, uh, and I'll be careful how I state this, you can be healthier at every size, right? Doesn't mean you're automatically healthy, but you can be healthier through adopting uh, um, um, healthy lifestyle choices and, and seeking treatment, even if, again, your weight doesn't make you a men's health or a women's health cover model. I, I think it is, I, so I do, I do agree that you, you can still physically be by BMI classified as overweight and be healthy, because again, and we could have a whole nother conversation about this. We could talk about the flaws of BMI as well. Um, and, and there are people who are in the normal weight uh, category who also have health issues that are still associated with extra body fat. Uh, and so, but uh, yeah, that, that's another myth that I, I think is an important one that we tackle. Yeah, well, I, you know, definitely. And, and I think it's safe to say we could probably spend a broadcast, every broadcast on these myths to really talk about it. I know we have some questions about it, but we'll give you a play, folks a place to kind of direct that. So who do have additional questions about some of the content? So we'll get to that in a moment. But um, this does kind of bring us to the end of our broadcast, which is crazy. That went pretty fast. But Joe, we have so appreciated your time in yes. spending. Thank and. You and enlightening us. I mean, we're so lucky that we get to kind of hear your your uh, your thoughts and insights here and how great that you can share them with folks in this platform. So thank you so much for taking part in this today. My pleasure and a great job, guys. And uh, you look great on that studio. That, ah. That's super impressive. So uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. So. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Well, as we mentioned, um, this is kind of the conclusion of, of our very first broadcast. That wasn't so bad, right? No, was, I, we, we got through it. I think so. And, um, you know, we have so many uh, viewers following us. And I do think we need to acknowledge that, um, you know, for we have a great following um, for members on the Gulf Coast. I know that you guys are bracing for um, Hurricane Zeta. So we very much know what that's like here in the state of Florida. So our thoughts are with you guys as it approaches. Please, please stay safe. Um, but, you know, we do want to thank everyone again for joining us at home and it might be time to announce our winners for I the giveaway. I think it's giveaway announcement Giveaway time. time. All right, so we have, um, we have some really great prizes, as we talked about, our, tum Absolutely. our tumbler, coffee mug, and hat. So James, you, you take the first one. Yeah, so it looks like, uh, well, what order? Do we just want to just kind of randomly assign the prizes? Or? Well, no, we're, so, um, so we're having our folks follow social media um, on the staff here, and they've randomly selected folks at, at random through an Excel. So that's what they've done. And so it looks like our first winner is Julie Schwartz. So and do we want to go Turvis to mug? Julie's that... getting the Turvis. Yes, oh, she dang. is. Congratulations, Julie. And we will go ahead and in all of this, for those who are winners, we're going to message you directly via social media. So you'll hear from Kelly, who's our social media guru. Who's our next winner? Uh, looks like we have Michelle Hockett. You will now receive this wonderful <gasps> OAC Congrats, hat. Michelle. Congratulations. Highly coveted item. And it looks like our last giveaway is Katie Barton. Katie is the official winner of our official OAC coffee mug. Round of applause for our winners, drawn at random. Thank you, Kelly, who's managing that on the back end for us. Um, great excuse to make sure that you stick around for a future uh, broadcast. Invite friends and family to join. They, we're going to have other cool prizes um, as, we, as we come Absolutely. along with this. And speaking of next time, so for next month, please make plans to join us. We're going to have more thought-provoking topics. We're going to bring in the experts and have some of these really important topics addressed. The next broadcast, it's easy to remember, it's the week before Thanksgiving. So Wednesday, November the 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 
same time, so easy to remember. So mark your calendars and stay tuned to our channels for more information. Yeah, absolutely. And we want you to stay connected with us as we continue from now to the next broadcast. Follow us on our, our social media channels, our OAC website. Tell us what you thought about today's broadcast. What ideas do you have for the future? I know a lot of you may have submitted a myth that, that you didn't get answered. Send that myth to social at obesityaction.org. We want to hear from you. We want you to continue to interact with us. That's what really this is all about right. at the end of the day. This is another way for us to connect with you and for you to connect with us. And so we're so excited to, to put a wrap on broadcast number one. Absolutely. We hope you liked it. We certainly enjoyed our time and um, want to get to know you more through those comments and future broadcasts. So stay tuned to more. As we mentioned, there's lots more in store that OEC does just beyond this broadcast. Great opportunity. Again, questions, anything, submit them to that to that email address you see. So that's a wrap, I think, on our first broadcast. It is. More to come. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Everyone stay safe out there, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.